uh, for the preliminary prelude to the keynote. Um, poster sessions. There are five poster sessions during the conference um, today and tomorrow. Um, and they occur during breaks between uh, either keynotes like today uh, or paper sessions. You can see it on the schedule when there's the poster session A, B, C, D, E. What we're asking for attendees to do during that period, where there is also beverages, coffee, things like that, is to approach the three or four poster presenters during that particular session and ask them about their work. They're there to talk and share their work with you um, uh, in a formal way. And the posters can be seen on the wall in the courtyard, in the arcade area. So uh, we just encourage attendees during these particular breaks, poster sessions to engage the poster authors uh, to talk about their work. Of course, their work will be up throughout the duration of the conference and you can connect at any time, but those particular sessions are when they're, they're standing there with, with their work and ready to engage. So thank you for that. Um, Uber drivers, there's been a few people asking about Uber share, sharing Uber is a function of being uh, at a distance from the school. Um, if you're interested in that, just go to the registration desk. Ethan uh, will create a list and attempt to self-organize or work with you to arrange, make arrangements to share an Uber to and from the conference um, for those that uh, would like that. So just head there. Um, tours. Um, there are a number of folks that have initially, months and months ago, checked the box that they wanted to do this tour. Um, the, there are a number of people that checked that box that are not here at this conference because they opted for the virtual session in May, but they still show their name as registered for the tour. So those logistics haven't been totally sorted out. So what we want you to do is if you're interested in the tour, either confirming what your plan is because you checked it and you're here and you're still interested in that tour, to go to the registration desk and confirm you're interested in one of those three tours. Uh, as a function of some not here and check the box there is openings for those that are interested that never did check, but you're now interested. Go to the registration desk. Ethan is taking the list so that we can finalize who is going on the tours um, uh, or not. So we just need to we need to kind of finalize that, uh, preferably by the end of today. So another housekeeping detail. Uh, we have a special group dinner tomorrow. Um, there will be, it will be off site in a neighborhood called Wynwood. Um, and there will be a couple of buses here uh, at six o'clock, six, between six and 6.30 that will take, that will move participants to the restaurant location. Some of you have cars, feel free to take your cars, you don't have to get on the bus, but the buses are there to assist anybody to get from here to the restaurant uh, in Linwood, and which is an outdoor venue, uh, and they will also return people back to FIU. So the dinner arrangement is between seven and nine p.m. So if you're on your own, just manage your time relative to uh, arriving at seven o'clock as close to that as you can. Um, that's the window that we have in the restaurant for. Uh, that special group dinner, which I think will be memorable. So um, I think with that, that's that's all I, I have to say at this moment. So we turn it over. Great. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Roberto Rivera, I'm the chair of the Landscape Architecture, Environmental and Urban Design program here at FIU, Landscape Architect. 
And I'm Jason Chandler. I'm Associate Professor in the Department of Architecture. Um, and we wanted to begin this conversation uh, about climate uh, as a, a way to you know, introduce our, 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 our first keynote, but I'm um, gonna also maybe continue some of the threads that were presented last night. Um, Roberto and I are both practitioners. Um, I'm an architect, he's a landscape architect, um, and we, we practice here in Miami. So um, we wanted to kind of sort of break this idea of what that means, where you are right now in the context of climate. And I'll just start with a sort of quip that if you were to ask someone what the climate was in Miami, some of the people would talk about the weather, other people would talk about the fiscal context of what climate was. Is it a good time to buy or sell? Um, so you have to be very aware of, of that. Um, and then I would say the other thing, uh, I'll just do the sort of legacy stuff. Yeah. And then the other thing that's interesting is that uh, last night, one of the things that was interesting was uh, the idea that this is a young city, right? And that it is a young city. Um, and its legacy is um, seemingly not there, right? Like what, what, is, what are the old historic things that constitute the value of the place? Um, but oddly enough, and uh, Miami doesn't necessarily acknowledge that it has legacy, but it does in, in, in a kind of interesting way relative to, to, to the environment. And as a state, the state of Florida really is in a way an environmentalist state. Um, the Everglades is, I believe, one of the la largest uh, national parks in, in, in the country. Um, and wildlife and the preservation of wildlife is actually ingrained <laughs> on both sides of the aisle, sort of Republicans and Democrats would sort of agree that that was something worth preserving. Um, but again, to, to, to further define where you are, one way to sort of get everyone to agree with that is to sort of say that the climate and environment is important and that in, the, in its end, this is a means to an end is, 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 is enough, right? That we should preserve this for future generations. The other is how to turn a buck, right? So there is this very famous painter, his name is Guy Harvey. He does these wild fish, fish pictures or on t-shirts in, in uh, you know, the, the, the Florida Keys. And basically the logic of, of his preservation efforts as it relates to sea life is they basically monetize the value of a fish in the water. And there's, I forgot the, the fish, the fish is. The pump, a pompano is a type of fish and it's calculated to be worth $8,000 based on the economies that this one fish creates for people who come here to fish it, just so. <laughs> Right, so, so as crass that, as that sounds, as bizarre as it sounds, and that will get you buy-in from the hotel industries, from all the tourist industries, and everyone will agree: yes, we should not kill all the fish, we should not pave over the Everglades because there's money to be had here. So I, I just wanted to introduce that, and then I'll, I'll turn this over to my colleague Roberto. <laughs> So uh, with that sort of poetic introduction to, <laughs> to our natural world, it is true. I mean, the, the legacy of Florida precedes our city and our cities, um, and it is that natural world. Um, we've happened to have lived here during a time of accelerated expansion that is defined by this constant boom-bust cycle. Um, and it is a city that is between these two vast natural systems, the Everglades to the west, Biscayne National Park to the east, and somehow our city is, is in that band in the middle. Um, and it lends itself to different kinds of innovations to, to make the most out of that very narrow uh, you know, geography that we inhabit. So we're both on the water and of the water. This is something that uh, we talked about yesterday. But it's really about that, the dynamics of, of, of those systems, that boom and bust. And interestingly, I guess I would say that it's, it's a city and a region that thrives because of adversity, not in spite of adversity. Uh, there are, uh, you know, adversity brings opportunity and there are some interesting parallels with the natural world. Um, our ecosystems, for example, we have pine grasslands that depend on fire. They don't survive because, you know, they survive fire. They depend on fire 
because it clears the ground, it gets rid of invasives, it presents this opportunity for regeneration. We have hardwood hammock plant communities that are, have evolved over thousands of years to shed the extra weight of branches and maintain a strong core on many of its trees. Uh, we have mangroves that contrary to popular belief, they don't need salt water to grow. They actually have managed to outcompete other uh, species because they can handle the adversity of lack of nutrients and salt in the water. And there are plant communities that have co-evolved over thousands of years in this kind of complementary dependency. And I think there's some interesting parallels there with a city that goes through this reinvention, even, even in its short history. And there's some parallels too in the papers, um, and you know, maybe we can talk about that, where the idea that, um, that resilience requires a shifting of our conception of practice and uh, you know, definitions, like a waterfront is no front at all, for example. It's this kind of like shifting back and forth, more of a region, more of a dynamic thing, for example. Um, the things that we measure, maybe it has to go beyond measuring energy, uh, you know, the, 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 the impact of energy in a building and its impact on ecosystems and environments. These are some of the things that we, we kind of identified in, in, you know, in finding or looking at, I, I see this to be more analogous to the natural world, to these kind of dynamics. And so it's kind of an architecture paradigm shift, which could learn from these natural systems. So, so one thing that I, I, I will, again, in, in the built environment as a kind of practitioner, um, this is a place that ideas of sustainability are inherently tied to economics. Um, and the idea is that you, you develop things, right? And that they, they do not take away from the future and that there's a kind of legacy of, of, uh, uh, of, of building. Um, and there are some, some positions that, that, that take the idea that one way to kind of make the smallest amount of impact on, on our environments is to build durably, right? Now, you probably all have heard that we had a condo collapse. Um, and it's, it's, it, we are not in the business necessarily of durable buildings, right? This is about building for a buck, you're gonna sell the building and it's a vehicle of capital. Um, and I think one thing that's interesting that the sort of the attacks, the, the, the sort of core of what's going on here is an idea, which I think many of you probably already heard of, um, is this idea of a moratorium on new construction. It's sort of going through different uh, uh, fields right now. And that would, that would be something that would sort of you know, arrest the, the, the context that is Miami, right? Um, what's interesting about the moment right now, and, and we've we practiced here for a while, the moment right now, this post-COVID building boom is arguably the biggest building boom in, in Miami, which is sort of stunning. And I've talked to many professionals, like it's amazing that that's what's going on right now. Um, but I think what is in, sort of hopeful about uh, this conference and about this, the, the papers that we read, we were both uh, paper reviewers, is that what is interesting is the idea that the, 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 the there were a few papers that dealt with new construction, but on the whole, most of them dealt with this idea of use, right? That some kind of existing condition, whether it's buildings, urbanisms, or landscapes, um, that use was defined, and I'm speaking broadly about many of the papers that we reviewed, um, in terms of energy consumption, and then also in terms of occupation. And I think if you look at the, the group of papers that you'll see today, um, they really connect those two, that use is something that is ultimately something about well-being, but it's also about how energy is being uh, uh, consumed. Um, and last night's speaker did speak about that uh, in terms of the car, right? Like that that's the biggest sort of problem. And if you all traveled here or about to travel to Winville, you'll, you'll, you'll really get a full uh, sense of what that means. Um, so I think um, for that sort of hopeful future, I think part of this is going to be recalibrating what we understand is the profession and what we are doing as active designers, practitioners. But um, I think the idea of occupation of existing contexts is, is probably that thing that 
is the shift that we'll be seeing in the future. Um, and again, to, to um, also think of this idea of, of youth, you know, as Miami's history is short, 120 years, but in that time, um, there's this kind of uh, tension I, I would describe between short-term planning and long-term planning. And clearly yesterday we saw this desire to have this long-term plan, but then there's this tension of development and growth and everybody comes here to, to build and, you know, the last 10, 15 years have been remarkable in terms of how that has changed. So the topic of resilience, you know, is, exists in that tension. How do you, how do you balance these, these two, these two things? And that's why I think this region is, is, in, in a sense, it's not unique. I mean, this happens in, in other places, but it is truly a laboratory for how those tensions can be, can play out. Um, and it's both, uh, the youth implies courage in a way for not knowing, so it's perhaps naivete and courage. And I think we've kind of seen that um, in the way that the city has evolved. Uh, and there are some, some checks and balances that are in place. You know, we had, uh, we have big, government programs like the Everglades restoration that dates back, you know, a good at least 20 years um, to kind of remedy some of the infrastructures that were built to drain and allow for development, for example, and that interruption of the natural flow that has defined this, this region for hundreds of thousands of years, that initiative was put in place to try and curb some of those, um, some of those, uh, the negative aspects of, of, building where it doesn't necessarily make sense to build. Um, the other thing is we do have an urban development boundary uh, in Miami, in our, in our, in our county, um, but that is also at the, uh, at the whims of, you know, the economy and the political will. And that line, we've actually done a small video that shows how that line has this creep, this natural creep, uh, that again is is uh, subject to the to the to the winds, the political winds, and the economic uh, opportunity winds. Um, so th those are two, I guess, large scale attempts to to curb uh, and to, to plan in the long term, but also contend with the short term challenges. Yeah, I mean, I will say just because uh, you're you're all going to be going to Winwood. Winwood is very interesting because it is a unique. Uh, experiment in, in urbanism in Miami, not something that's necessarily unique in the rest of the world, but it is a, a planned area that, that, that had a limit of heights. I think it's eight stories. Um, and the development there, which is insane, huge amount of building in the last few years, which was going to go into at least a few more years in the future, where they're actually building out city blocks and promoting a kind of walkable, non-car based sort of urbanism, which is Again, may not, at least from people in Europe, may seem like, like what? Like <laughs> nothing particularly exciting about that. But for Miami, it's a very rare species indeed. Um, and the idea that it also is mixed use and all these different things in, that are embedded in that is ultimately a kind of political negotiation between a set of developers and the city, um, which allows for that context to occur. Um, but it's, it's a kind of episodic thing. It's, it's only for that group of people. It's a special sort of use, it's an overlay. Um, and how that necessarily reflects all of Miami, it itself does not, but it does speak to the idea of how things are changed in a city like Miami. Um, I don't know if you have well, last comments, because we have a, is a guy on. Yeah, uh, well, I was just one, one, one final thing I was gonna say that no matter what, I think this region attracts all kinds of diversity. I mean, we have biodiversity, which obviously you, you look around, we have that natural world, but we have an immense cultural diversity in places that were, you know, Miami is really, uh, anywhere you go, you have a diversity of languages and cultures. And, and that in fact is, uh, I think it's an optimistic city in the way that it sees itself and the way that people who come here look to the city in an optimistic light as a way to reinvent themselves on the upswing of the boom bust cycle. I guess I would describe that. So are we ready for our keynote intro? I guess so. Is he online? He's on. He's on? He's yeah. on. Okay. okay. So does that mean? That do we turn off the light and I'll do a quick introduction? Is he on, on? No. Let's see. Where's our, uh, where's our tech guy? Anyone? Yeah, if you want to dim the light, but we need to. We need to have our keynote. Um, yeah. Let's see. 
There we go. Is he, can we get him on the screen? Okay, he's there, so. Um, today's keynote is architect Jeremy Till. He is the head of Central St. Martin, Martin's and the pro vice chancellor of the University of Arts London. He previously served as the Dean of Architecture and the Built Environment at the University of Westminster and the Head of Architecture at the University of Sheffield. He is co-recipient of the RIB A Sustainable Prize for Nine Stock Archard Street and the co-author of Everyday Architecture, both with Sarah Wigglesworth. He is also co-author of numerous subsequent books, including Flexible Housing, Architecture Depends, and Spatial Agency. All three of these books won the RIBA President's Award for Outstanding Research. More recently, he worked on a major EU-funded research project on scarcity and creativity, resulting in the book, The Design of Scarcity. He curated the British Pavilion in the 2006 Venice Architecture Biennale, co-curated the UK Pavilion. I can't hear anybody. Can anyone hear me? Which is a stupid question. <laughs> How weird. Okay, you can hear me. So I'm gonna have this very strange thing of speaking into a void. Could you, someone allow me to... Okay, I can hear you now. Can someone allow me to share a screen, please? How many people in the room? Am I speaking to two people? A hundred people? One hundred. One hundred. Okay. That's good. <laughs> you should be able to share your screen. Try it again. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. So many thanks for having me here. Well, not there, but sort of somewhere. Um, so I warn you that by the end of my talk, um, you may not thank me. I don't think my lecture is a comfortable one. And this is because I'm not comfortable, not in this virtual space, but in the space of the world at the moment and what is happening in Ukraine, but also because what is happening in Ukraine is surely a symptom of wider breakdowns. So if my words come across harshly, this is not to be judgmental of anyone in the audience, but it's rather a direct reflection of my anxiety and the need then to respond to that anxiety by taking action. So although I will be critical of some of the terms already being used. I hope that through that criticality, something more positive can emerge. The lecture is called Architecture After Architecture, which is my current research project with uh, a collaborative that we formed called Mold. And the website is mold.earth and the Twitter is, and whatever is that. And 
the members of the collective are here in Braunschweig is Sarah Povlet, Tatiana Schneider, Christina Sarifi, and Julius Grambau. And in London, there's me, Anthony Powis, and Becca Verkler. And I want to be clear that what I'm saying is not me alone, but is very much a, a collaborative effort. And indeed, as I'll show you, I'll be drawing on some of the um, ideas of, of everybody in, in, on that screen. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is very quickly take you through the elevator pitch of the project, the pitch which we won some funding for, amazingly, because as you'll see, the pitch is quite polemic, that normally with research grant applications, you have to be terribly good and you have to tick boxes and you have to limit yourself, whereas we went in all guns blazing because of the urgency of the situation in relation to climate. So the, the, the elevator pitch is pretty straightforward, actually, though uncomfortable, which is that architecture is bound to the modern project, that the modern project, it says that sharing is paused. Is it paused or can you still see me? Hello? I'm not sure whether you can resume share. Wait a minute. Can someone help me sharing again? Or do I need to stop sharing? Yikes. Uh, just wait a minute, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. A bit nicer. Are you, can it's, you hear us? I can hear, yeah. It's, is it moving on? Here, do it from there. You have the, the host. There's a question and answer. The trouble is, something's happened. Oh, God. Jeremy, can you stop sharing the screen and start again? I'm going to have to. Um, I can't because. Okay, let's try again. Okay. Is that okay? Are you on? Yes. Yes. Okay, so the argument is, is that architecture is tied to the modern project and that the climate emergency or climate breakdown, as I'm going to talk about it, signals the end of the modern project because the tenets of the modern project are no longer appropriate or even um, survivable. And therefore, architecture itself is also, as we know it, inappropriate. So that's the elevator pitch. If I then move on and take us through some of the aspects of that, of the modern project and the definitions of the modern project, and I want to do that by going through four, uh, five aspects of the modern project. The first is the modern project has to endlessly sing signal progress. That is a founding feature of the modern project is that it is always moving forward. Indeed, the foundation, the Faustian pact of the modern project was a break from the traditions of the past, which were seen to be static in order that society could move forward. And what happens is that architecture is used as the handmaiden and the symbolization of that progress. And we saw that particularly at the end of the 20th century in the beginning of the 21st century as a form of almost hysterical 
endless so-called innovation, generally through formal innovation or structural innovation or aesthetic in innovation. So architecture in its ability to symbolize and to represent progress is tied into the modern project. The modern project is also absolutely bidden to the project of growth. If things are going backwards, then the modern project dies, which is why there's such hysteria when recessions hit economies, when the collapse of the global economy in 2008 was not just an economic collapse, it was also seen as a cultural collapse of the modern project. And architecture again is used as a vehicle and a symbolization of growth. And we just heard, you know, Miami just going through a post pandemic building boom is part of that, that somehow we're out of the pandemic and therefore what do we do? We go into a boom and architecture is used as a vehicle and symbol of that new growth. The next aspect of the modern project, I'm going really quickly here, but this is a kind of elevator pitch, the tall building, I must admit. Um, the next aspect of it is that the modern project is also a project of ordering. It orders society, and in that ordering, it also excludes. And therefore, the modern project is canonically part of a Western global north project of ordering, colonizing the rest of the world in order to exclude all those things which are outside of the priorities and tenets and, 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 and modes of the modern project. And again, architecture, particularly in the early 20th century, but you can see it in words oh, like master planning, is used endlessly as, you okay? Um, we don't think the uh, slides are showing correctly. We're seeing the first page. Oh God, I really not quite sure what to do. I will guess I'll have to stop again. Yes, yes stop again. Yeah, stop and restart. If she has a PDF of the slide, that's what she's talking about. Isn't this full screen? Yeah. Jeremy, don't, don't use full screen, just uh, move around the PowerPoint and go back. Screen. Don't do full screen, is what you're saying, yeah? Right, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so what I will do is I won't play it, so I'll fit slide and I will increase size. How's that? Uh, slide only. Yeah, that's good. Is that okay? Go, go back and forward. So you can talk about it. Um, wait a minute. Now I can't go back and forward. So I'm going to have to have a navigator on. And I was on this one. Okay. Is that okay? What are you seeing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the trouble is, you're going to miss all my beautiful transitions, which I was up till two o'clock in the morning doing. But in the <laughs> Um, and some of the transitions are rather important, so I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do about that. Um, okay, so order and architecture is used as, again, the vehicle, but also this sort of sense in the early 20th century project of if you order architecture at the same time, in some way you order society. And then the fourth aspect is that of reason. So the modern project is a project from the Enlightenment of the application of reason, generally of male reason, in order to, and I'll talk about this later, solve the problems of the world. And architecture is absolutely tied into that sense of uh, using reason in the form of science and technology as a means to ally itself to the modern project, but also ally itself to the various strategies of the modern project. And over it all, is the modern project's will to order nature. Man's dominion over nature is an absolutely fundamental part of the modern project in which nature is seen as another thing which can be abstracted, which can then be extricated and then can in some way be demolished. And so these are the aspects and architecture clearly in its opposition to nature is part of the modern project's dominion over nature. 
So the next bit then talks about why climate signals the end of the modern project. And this is one of the most poignant slides for me, which is the bushfires in Australia two years ago, in which the beach, which is a place of leisure, which and leisure is, is a kind of fundamental part of the culture of the modern project, the beach becomes the only place of sanctuary. And so in a way that the whole kind of aspect of the modern project is destroyed right in front of our eyes within its image. But if I then go on to the way that climate destroys the modern project, or I think it does, the tenants of the modern project, how can you talk about progress when polar bears are floating around on ice caps which have been melted away from their home? More significantly, I think, how can we still talk about the need for growth when the graph is not just going up in a kind of diagonal way, which is the first graph, which you didn't see, but is now pointing almost vertically upwards. And what is on the, on the vertical aspect could be anything. It could be CO2 production, it should be destruction of, of biodiversity, it could be the rise of, of, of flash flooding, it could be, et cetera, et cetera. And what is happening on the graph of growth is that once that graph goes vertical, that's the end of history. And it's not too, given the IPPC report that came out at the beginning of the week, that's more or less what they're saying, that we have a tiny window. But how can we talk about growth as part of the modern project when I present very simply a graph like that? How can we talk about the order of the modern project when issues of climate, and I don't just mean weather disruptions and flooding and whatever, but also the way that, that you can identify, there's a very good podcast about identifying the, um, the, the tragedy in Ukraine as part of much wider issues around the carbon state. So these ideas that modern project is a project of ordering is are definitively disrupted by climate. And as I get to the sense then that you can apply the project of reason to climate breakdown is something which I want to challenge right, right firmly. And then obviously the end of the modern project is also seen in the devastation to the natural world, to the non-human world. So the question we ask ourselves then is what is architecture after architecture? Architecture as we know it, and this I don't think is, is just a polemic now. I think this is a very serious and real question about once the climate emergency has taken, pulled the rug from underneath the, the founding tenets in the modern project and with it the founding tenets of architecture culture as we know it, then what is architecture afterwards? And that was the question we asked ourselves within the research bid. And the research has been going for about eight months, so we don't yet have the answer. But I, what I want to do is talk about some other things. And this sense of this Casper David Friedrich picture versus this I, I man looking over nature, but in the end having a kind of authority over it, versus this amazing photograph from Australia of a man collapsed with his dog looking helplessly at the raging forces of nature. So what I want to talk about then is the use of language. And I, I, it looks that Tony is gonna to do probably a more articulate version of this later today for you uh, from the subject of a le lecture. But what we've come up against endlessly within our research project is the use of language. Language is within the field of climate and sustainability and resilience as I talk about, is often received as a given, as a fixed point. And the will to categorize is of course another trait of the modern project. And language is a powerful tool in the marshalling of the lines of what is acceptable, what is included and what is excluded. So I think the, the looking at language of, of, of the climate seems to us almost a starting point if we are then going to move out of the stranglehold of the received versions of these words. And what I want to do is to unpick some of these received versions, which is where it gets uncomfortable. 
and try not to fall in the trap of replacing with something else, because in replacing them for something else, I will replace them with another definition. And in another definition, I will be claiming my own authority. But rather to suggest more open, more provisional, more liminal contexts in which these words may operate. So the first word I have to obviously deal with is that of resilience, because that's the title of the conference. And the conference website opens with this picture of, of this kind of benign urbanity of, of a place to go and have cocktails to swim, of, of photoshopping so that the, the sky is so blue and the sea is so green. And people came, possibly attracted by that image. What would have been, and this is where I, I regret not having my, um, <laughs> my because there's a there's a gift coming up of, in which I can't play now. But what would have been instead if the conference website had done this? Which is frankly a more realistic presentation of Miami, in which over the last seven years there have been and I'm sure each time one of these came along someone a mayor or a politician or somebody said this is once in a lifetime event but blimey once a once in a lifetime event happens on an annual basis you know that you're in trouble now if that had been the opening of the conference website I think people would still have come because these images provoke an urgency to do something. And this has become the dominant understanding of resilience, to defend, to protect, to adapt, to mitigate. And then it's the assumed role of experts, of academics, like an audience like this, of architects, of professionals, to convene these systems of defense, often through the deployment of technocratic systems. Meanwhile, in other parts of the world, beyond the reach of technocratic regimes or access to technical solutions, the people most affected by the climate change are told simply to be more resilient, to fall back themselves on themselves, to learn to be resilient. And as with many of the words that I come to, this understanding of resilience on the one hand, a technocratic patching of, of the here and now, technocratic patching, on the other hand, a laissez-faire casting off, only addresses the effects, not the causes. Resilience, in all its busy but good intents, might actually be a form of amnesia, a forgetting of what is really at stake. Worse is when resilience in a quote like the one up on the wall is described as a form of shock absorber, something that absorbs the power of unleashed nature. So to, as to allow exactly the systems that have released these powers to persist and perpetuate. And so to continue the fiction that we humans are resilient in the face of these forces, thereby reinforcing the modern myth of man's dominion over nature. And this is a really important point. And, and this quote, in a way, it's like shooting fish in the barrel, because I think this quote is so desperate in a way, in, in the way that it describes a will to keep things going rather than a will to understand why things have gone wrong in the first place. So my question is, what would this conference or any conference on resilience have been like instead of having it introduced by pictures of bucolic urbanity, or instead of having it introduced by pictures of, of so-called once-in-a-lifetime flooding ha happening on an annual basis, that we'd put up the words of Adrienne Marie Brown. Because her version, their version of, of, of resilience is very different. It's one 
of the human dimension and human relationships. When we're engaged in acts of love, we humans are at our best, most resilient. And of course, what she's talking about is not just the relationship of the human to the human, but also the relationship of the human to the non-human. And we want shifts in the direction of ecological resilience, ecological resilience, not a kind of technical resilience of water barriers or, or easy fixes, but resilience which is tied into a solidarity with critters, which is, I'll come to these posters later, but also it's tied into issues of, of social equity. So that's my first take. The second is, I think, really shooting fish in a barrel, which is the word sustainability, particularly when I put it up against a scheme like this one, which is in Stefano Boeri in, in China, that, that it, it, it must be sustainable because it's got trees in it. And that sort of desperate naivety as to what constitutes sustainability is, is something which is so prevalent in our profession that we've become almost immune to it, which is why the word sustainability as part of this received and given thing needs to be challenged. And I'm gonna challenge it quite simply by taking the famous definition of sustainability from the Brunton report, now almost you know, 35 years old, but still the one which is quoted in, in endless books and endless keynotes. And so I'll take that and, and, and take it apart. And the first easy bit to take apart is, is these two words, sustainable and development. I mean, you, you can't have these two words together because development demands growth because well, that's how development is, is described in, under the terms of the modern project. And so under the terms of growth, then how can you be sustainable? So that even having these two words together, sustainable and development, is something which one needs to, to critique. The second is this word, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present. Now that might be okay, but unfortunately, under the dominance of late capitalism, needs are always transferred into wants. Late capitalism works through the kind of circus of desire, always fueling our wants. Sustainability may actually be much better defined if we just talk about our needs. And if we talk about our needs, and then we extract architecture from the marketplace has, has already been introduced and actually talk about it in completely different ways as human needs rather than market driven wants, then sustainability might work. But in the Brunton thing, I think that, that, that it's wrong because it's not acknowledging that the real problem is the driving of wants. Then this word compromising. 1987, we already knew that the world and the planet was being compromised. You know, the pioneering research was done by Exxon in the late 60s, and then, of course, suppressed by the leaders of Exxon for commercial reasons, but we already knew. And therefore, it was wrong within this report to suggest that, that, that the world was not already compromised. It should have been much more hard hitting. And what one therefore gets is a sense of a kind of benign era in which sustainability casts a, a, a kind of a glow of warmth over us all because we may still be able, and this is the key point, to sustain. So the trouble with the word sustainability is that it kids us that we can sustain our present systems our present lifestyles, our present addictions, our present reliance on growth. Well, it's not reliance, but we're told we are reliant on growth and so on and so forth. And so sustainability as a word, I think is a disingenuous term because it doesn't confront the real aspects of systemic change that we need. Indeed, it suggests that we don't need systemic change. And in another poster that, that we've done as part of the research, 
which, which people shout at us, we just write sustainability is capitalism. Because sustainability, and already this has been talked about, that sustainability in, in architecture is always seen as part of, of, of an economic system. And it's absolutely clear that if we're going to address the climate breakdown, we also have to address economic systems as well, which means that sustainability tied into greenwash, sustainability tied into meaningless corporate responsibility statements have, has to be challenged. In fact, I would say that we now need to move away from it. But still talk about sustaining in a different sense of the sustaining of planetary systems. So we need to shift sustainability away from a technocratic understanding of it or simply an anthropocentric understanding in, in, of it into a planetary understanding of it. The next word I want to talk to is, is solutions. And solutions will be included, I suspect, in, in many of the um, conference papers, because that's what, as I'll talk about, experts need to do in order to sustain their credibility as experts. So this is not meant to be a criticism of individual. This is a criticism of, of the whole machinery of, of expertise. And what we get, and what's kind of interesting is that I got this picture from this website, which already is, I've already has got two of my favorite words on it. Um, and now I'm about to get my third favorite word on it as well. And there was a lovely transition where I moved in and out, but anyway, just imagine it. Solutions. So the modern project is founded, or it's not founded, but it has at the heart of it, this idea of rational man as expert, seeing the world as a set of problems which only the rational mind and man can solve. There's this fantastic quote from Rainer Bannum, a professional, I don't need to read it out. Don't read your own slides, Jeremy. That's presentation 101. Okay, so you can read that. Um, and what's interesting within our profession, whether it's academic profession or architectural or planning or landscape professions, is this holds, holds true. That somehow that what we are defined through is our ability to quote unquote, solve problems. And I'd say that happens under late capitalism in a way which is getting more and more atomized in the way that, that you know, the classic half business school solution is to outsource all, all things. You're also outsourcing knowledge. So knowledge is broken down into smaller and smaller chunks of expertise and peer reviewing reinforces those chunks of expertise. Whereas in fact, what one needs is to understand the world, not as a set of problems, but a set of interrelated relationships in which then by intervening in one bit of that network of relationships, you have to understand that you're also making adjustments in other bits of that. And so this sense that what happens particularly within the rhetoric of sustainability in relation to climate is that it holds out an endless promise that somewhere, sometime, a solution will be found. COP26 was absolutely did that, that it just pushed, it pushed the so-called problem down the road to Egypt without actually addressing that the climate emergency is not a problem that can be solved. And that may sound a controversial thing to say, but it's true. Treating climate as a project of design, which can be solved, and that is the, the sort of the old fashioned definition of design is design is a problem solving activity, is to simplify climate. It reduces it to something that can be claimed by expertise that they alone can intervene in. Problem solving is never neutral. It reinforces certain ways of operating, generally those of the global north and the knowledges of the global north, while excluding others, the indigenous knowledges of the global south, 
the relational knowledges of, of feminism and so on and so forth. But most of all, what the solutionist approach does, it foregrounds effects, the effects of climate as matters to be dealt with. In the same way as I said about resilience, it ignores their causes and in particular their political constitution. Problem solving within the guise of the modern project is seen to be, because it's rational, is seen to be so-called rational, is seen to be so-called neutral. Whereas in fact, it's highly contested that the climate is clearly not simply something which is a neutral problem to be solved, let alone that the, that the solving the problem is going to get us over a hump somewhere down the line, that we need to deal with the here and now of what the volatility of the climate breakdown has presented us with. We are already exceeding planetary boundary. Tipping points are in play. Forces have escaped that can never be contained. And so that we need to move away, and here I'm going to jump over some of my funny slide. So there was a funny slide, so sorry, there's no humor now left at all in this lecture, just full on anxiety making. We have to move away from seeing the world as a set of problems to a set of relations, which we try to make sense of. And I write about this in Architecture Depends, and I, which I wrote some time ago, but somehow what I wrote then seems to be more not present, it makes me sound a bit strutting, but I think it's, it's more relevant than, than ever in as much as what I was talking about is not even attempting to use a kind of rationalist expertise as to apply to architecture, but to understand it as this contingent, dependent, provisional, open set of situations, which we can help, but we can't completely solve. The next word is emergency. Now, emergency can, as Rebecca Solnit and other people have talked about, is emergency does have within, within the word emerge, and therefore out of the emergency might have emerged new futures. But I want to talk about emergency also in, in the way that, although emergency is actually in, in the project title of, of both this lecture and also our research project, I think we're actually going to move away from it because emergency suggests an immediate crisis. I've had a car crash, I'm in emergency, I need to go to accident emergency ward in the hospital, and then my body is going to be fixed and I can walk away. The planet has had a car crash. It's going to be taken to the biggest accident emergency unit in the world and we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it here and now. And what that does is it suggests an immediate crisis cut off from its past constitution and blind to what an intentionally conceived future might be. Emergency, in all its imminence, closes down time. It takes time out of the thing. We just deal with it as this little atom of instant, which we have to deal with. And in doing that, it suggests an immediate fix, which would deliver us seamlessly miraculously into a time beyond the current ecological, social and economic crises. Emergency thinking presents climate as a point in time that can be moved away from, but climate in all its volatility overwhelms such simple narratives. The storms gather the past and foretell the future. And it's this temporal complexity of its constitution and where we might go to that needs to be addressed. I'm not going to do that slide. It's sort of self-explanatory that this is why climate is not a neutral issue and how we then might move away from it into, instead of talking, there's a transition here, so you won't see the word, but instead of talking about emergency, we should talk about climate breakdown which is not breakdown, I'm a mechanic and I'm going to come fix your broken down car, but breakdown in a much more radical sense that the pieces of the world which were once stable are now volatile and dispersed. 
and we need to rearrange them in completely different manners rather than fix the broken down car. Now I want to talk, move to growth. Growth is inevitably tied to extraction. To achieve growth, you have to extract. And architecture is bound more than almost any other discipline, except for infrastructure engineering, is bound to the extractivist economy in an apparently irredeemable manner. And therefore, this sense that if growth needs to be challenged, as of course it does, because otherwise we will exceed the planetary boundaries much quicker than even the Stockholm Institute are suggesting, that if growth is necessarily challenged, then we also have to challenge and think about extraction. And by extraction, I don't simply mean extracting of materials, though I do mean that too, because with the extraction of materials, you get the destruction of ecosystems, the burning of fossil fuels, and the extraction, abstraction, and so exploitation of nature. We also mean that architecture is tied into the extractivist and violent tendencies of late capitalism. Spatial production is complicit as a lever to extract excess value. And therefore, architecture is not only bound to the extractivist economy materially, but also economically. And the extractivist economic system is also a system which, as we can see all too clearly, promotes inequalities. So if you look at, for example, Russia at the moment, four to 500 oligarchs in Russia have the same wealth of, as 99.8% of the population. So the sense of the extractivist urge of late capitalism is also a violent tool of inequality. And the problem with extraction is that it is willfully blind to its effects. The imminent act of violence is either one to the non-human, to nature, or to the invisible, financial flows. And so that act of violence is all too easily either denied or overlooked because it does not appear to inflict immediate human hurt. So the marketplace of, 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 of Miami estate agents looks kind of okay, I guess, but downstream from it is unleashed a whole set of both material, natural and social inequalities. And therefore growth in the same way as, as it's presented, you know, you know, still on the on the on the daily news, you get you don't get why why don't on the daily news and the BBC don't we get CO2 emissions, growth in CO2 emissions? No, no, no. What we get is what is the pound worth against the dollar? Because that is seen to be by proxy an indication of whether our economy is growing or not. And that is also then a proxy for progress of the modern project. So extraction is blind to its effects until I put up a, a picture like this one. Extraction is also addictive. Extraction is, in the words of the Ecuadorian economist Alberto Costa, well-programmed amnesia. But the violent consequences and effects of growth and of its handmade and extraction are with us now and they cannot be turned away from. We have to face up to the effects of what architecture and its extractivist material and economic extractivist mode is doing to the human and non-human world. And we need to face up to our addiction to extraction and then towards new understandings of growth, new definitions of progress, and with it towards a post-extractivist architecture, which as we've written about in, in, in this pamphlet, which I'll get to, is one which is accountable. 
this quote from Adorno, I think is, you know, must be 60 years old, but is actually, I think, still more relevant today. We've got to re-describe what we mean by progress. And the final bit I want to talk about is, is around futures. So the question remains, what kind of futures will these forms of architecture after architecture take? And where will they be situated? What do we mean by this temporal future, which is necessarily bound to the past because you need to understand the constitution of the past, necessarily understood through the eyes of the present because that's how we should be, that's how we are most, our kind of visceral experience of the world is, is played out, but also then allows us to project into the future because the future cannot be just a mitigated version of the present. And this is where my critique of resilience comes in because it is, that is an adapted version of the, of the present. So we can't tinker with the status quo. We can't simply adapt it because that leaves, as I talked about, the underlying constitution, the underlying violences, the underlying causes of the climate breakdown in place. And current versions of architecture in relation to futures might be very quickly divided into two, two ways of seeing. The first is the future as, a, as an accelerated version of the present. What you do is you take existing conditions and apply something new to them, often a form of technology such as parametrics or such as artificial intelligence or robotics or whatever. And then you see what happens in the petri dish of the status quo being fed new forms of bacterial technological food. Generally, the result of these experiments, and I use that word because the experiment is seen as a necessary part of, of the project of, of progress, result in a pres presentation of a near future, something that's just beyond. You've taken a bit of the present and you've pushed it to something just beyond. New forms, new surfaces, new technologies. And these are signifiers of market demands and of so-called innovation. However, these fleeting representations of the near future leave the underlying divisive and violent conditions unexamined and so unscathed. So you're getting, a, you're getting it from all sides, the same argument being made, but repetition is sometimes useful. In the case of the most famous of these near future representatives and represent people who represent the near future, such as the parametricists, as I have added, or the so-called innovators such as Big, they actually exacerbate these conditions by commodifying and celebrating the spatial products of late capital. But also then the awful aspects of late capital, such as the rise of the populist right in, in, in Brazil, where you know, Bjarke Ingels seemed to be perfectly happy to have his photograph taken next door to one of the world's most notorious fascists. The second type of architectural futuring is that of the unbounded scenario in which the spatial imagination is projected into unheard of, unseen futures. The early histories of these architectural seers of Bucky, of Archigram, of Leb Woods, etc., and of, of all now their late educational followers on the east coast of America, in the heart of London, on the west coast of, of, of America and Sioc, that, that these, these histories are oft repeated, usually with tones of sort of sadness and, and exasperation as to why this greatness of the unfettered un imagination never landed, never, never really gained traction. But their failure, i.e. the fact they never gained traction, is almost certainly inevitable because their flights have no tethers to the here and now and so are easily cast adrift. And because they do not start with a critique of current constitutions, they can offer no resistance to them, and so are blown away by the dominant winds of reality. So if the first two, the, the, the kind of accelerated now or the speculative unfettered then future, don't work, 
we have to look for a third way, which is what we're trying to do in, in the project. And the third way is to see the future as here already, if only we look hard enough. There are futures found in the gaps of the present, where new fragile formations are already emerging, but need support and understanding, where bits of existing systems can be rearranged and brought together to develop new relations, and where futures are always founded on a critique of the status quo in order to move intentionally away from it. And with this resistant tendency, these futures have a chance of survival and meaning. And just to end with one of my favorite quotes, which is to do with how we might reach these futures, which is this sense that we do need the imagination. So I'm not saying this is a project of realism or a project of scientific instrumentation, instrumentality. It is also very much, and I'm sitting here in the headquarters of you know, one of the biggest creative institutions in the world, University of Arts London, in which what we're talking about is the use of the imagination in relation to the intentional design and imagining of new futures. And this fantastic quote from Lolo Olufemi, the structural, I am gonna read this one, the structural limits of this world restrict our ability to articulate all that the imagination is capable of conceiving. And so right from the start of my lecture in relation to resilience, and that all we can do is to fix and deal with those structural limits is a plea to open up to an understanding of new futures which are arising out of the here and now, but in a manner which both resists the, the dominating, dominating tendencies of the here and now in order that the climate breakdown demands new systemic relations, then also we can find new spatial relationships and that is the role potentially of architecture after architecture. Just then to finish with a kind of more personal bit very quickly. So some of this work is, is um, summarized in these very provisional, very short pamphlets, which are available on our website. And this, this would move miraculously up the screen, but won't, but mold.earth is, it, we're just putting everything out there. We're, we're not being precious about about what we share with the world, because we think that, that, that what small contribution we might, might be able to make needs to be out there and honest and provisional. But also, we also believe in this kind of sense that we need, in some way or another, to move outside of the academy into the place of public discourse and action. And the posters that we made, we made for COP26, and then as part of Central St. Martin's um, response to COP26, rather scarily, I walked with my students and staff uh, without permission through the streets of London and sort of walked straight down the Strand and stopped the traffic with, with, with both these uh, posters, but also these are architecture students, not our fashion students, lamenting the loss of the forest. And so this need to act is something which I think is important. And to end on a very personal note, which is to talk about my brother, if I can, without getting emotional, um, who is a professor of opera, but he is also here being arrested. Because my brother is a professor of opera, but he's also a member of Insulate Britain. 80 people of all ages, of all beliefs, of all faiths, of all types, who shut down Britain in the space of a week. And was arrested for it and so on and so forth. But I don't want to talk about that, but I do want to talk about how my brother then went back to his university and explained why he had done what he had done. And he used this quote. And I think this quote from Einstein is actually something which we all need to remember when we're sitting in our privileged place of academia, that we need to move from the privileged place of academia into the more challenging and contested place of action. Thank you.
And I can't, oh, when it stop share, why don't I stop sharing? Come back on the screen. I can't hear anybody, so someone say something. No, you should have that mic. Good. Any responses? Jeremy, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to know if you could speak uh, just to a moment with regard to this last point you were making regarding new formations in the present. Um, that, that the future is here and we're not we're not looking perhaps close enough. We're not reading the environment, paying attention in a way that I think you're trying to suggest. You could just speak a little bit more to what that is for you. Okay. Uh, that's a great question, thank you. I think the part of it is, is to do with our blindness and amnesia, which is stopping us looking. I think part of it is the dominance of what um, de Souza Santos calls the cognitive empire. I only certain forms of knowledge being allowed to be included and that necessarily then excludes other forms of knowledge. And he does a very straightforward analysis of global north and the cognitive empire versus global south about how vernacular and indigenous forms of knowledge. But what we're doing within the project, I don't know if people know spatial agency, which Tatiana and I did some years ago, where we collected what we thought were really interesting examples of, um, of stuff beyond architecture. Um, what we're doing in this one, we were gonna do that for this. We're gonna say, here's some lovely stuff and present it to the world. And we have, we, we collected 500 examples of just wonderful, inspiring projects from, from around the world. And then we were gonna get those down to 101 and present it like spatial agency. We've actually decided to do something a bit more active this time, which is to say, okay, let's treat these in the same way as I've just described as these kind of fragmentary moments, which if given the right support and the right conditions and are taken away from the barriers which they're currently presented with could grow into new forms and new scenarios. And the analogy that we're using is quite direct. We're using the analogy of mold and how mold grows and how you can, if you take slime mold, that slime mold can actually be quite intentional in the way that it grows, but it's not fully in control. And so what we're saying is, what's the soil on which you pass plant the seeds? The seeds are probably already there if you look closely enough, what's the kind of fermenting chamber, what's the conditions which allow that, those seeds to grow in a productive manner? And then what are the ingredients you have to add to them in order that they can find their full potential? And then from that, we will discover, invent with others, everyone can join in, we're going to be doing it in an open manner, new scenarios. Once we found the new scenarios, we present the new scenarios and then we work backwards and say, okay, what do these scenarios mean to spatial practice. How do spatial practitioners, aka architects, then involve themselves in these scenarios in a manner which uses spatial intelligence, which uses many of the things which, which we talk about in architecture school, but in a manner which is away from the fixation with the object. And so the, the, that's, that's kind of what we're, we're, we're trying to do. Can you give us some hints about some of these parallel futures we should integrate with? Some of the parallel futures? Yes. The ones that I don't like? Or the ones that, are, that we're aiming for? I mean, the, one, the ones that I, I'm, I am increasingly intemperate with are the ones of... <laughs> of the kind of the late utopians. 
I'm intemperate of those because I don't think they, they're political. I think that they suggest a radicality, but are actually very conservative. And I'm intemperate also, I don't know if Neil is in the room and he'd probably shoot me for saying this, I'm intemperate for some of the, 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 the forms of accelerated here and now in which, which new technologies are used to, to kind of accelerate the here and now, but I think potentially then also um, exacerbate the conditions. So those I would say are kind of these kind of parallel, when I say parallel, I, do, I think you use the word parallel. These are, these are parallel, I think, because they're not actually to do with the conditions that we're facing. They, they, they escape the conditions that we're facing on the one hand, or they exacerbate the conditions we're facing on the other. And so the futures that we're trying to construct and, and, and in the futures pamphlet, it, it, we, Becker, who wrote that, but in collaboration with us all, sets it out, I think, very well about how you resist the, the urge to just dream alone, although I think imagination is incredibly important, but also resist the urge simply to tinker with the here and now. I don't think we're quite where, there. And the, and the pamphlets, if you look at them, are, are 1,800 words. So they're, they're meant to be accessible. They're meant to be direct, but they're also provisional. Uh, in your website, you invite to write to the team for collaboration. Just write to us. What kind of collaboration are you envisioning and seeking? OK, two things. First of all, um, we are looking for um, great examples that when we can subject to mold, we can put into our little laboratory our, our, our own form of petri dish and, and see. So if if you are if you think that there are seeds of, of hope that we should know about, and and we are being there's lots of fantastic work being done around net positive carbon buildings, there's lots of good work being done around materials. So I don't think we can supplement that. So I think you know that that side of the world is actually being quite well catered for by groups in, in the UK, such as Architects Climate Action Network and Letty doing fantastic work on that side. So we're much more interested in the way that, that the climate breakdown is, is well, as I talked about, is bound into the conditions of late capitalism and what seeds are there which resist that, that connection, I, which look at, at critically at the causes of, of climate breakdown. So that's one way you can collaborate. The second way is that we will be having more open, um, and it, they will be online because we're not flying, uh, which is why I'm not there, um, more open sessions, which we're announced on our website where we will have sort of big climate assemblies, but also I think the, the scenario building has to be done as a collective act, because otherwise it just looks like we're we're a group of experts sitting in London and Braunschweig who, who know all the answers and we, we clearly don't. I've got a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. My name is Ken Fitzsimons. I'm from the Architecture and Landscape School in Bordeaux, in France. Um, it's more of a, less of a question than a conundrum. I'd like to hear your reflections on it. Um, the, the modern project is also uh, emancipation, emancipation from ecclesiastical power, uh, temporal power of monarchies, um, and emancipation from material constraints. I right? think this was a point that being well made in uh, Pierre Charbonnier's book, um, Affluence and Liberty, fantastic book, at the environmental history of political ideas. So today we're we kind of faced this problem that a lot of the, the comfort that we have with you know, the needs that are fulfilled are also, they also allow us to, a good number of people, despite going south problems, uh, to live relatively more free, with more liberty than in the past. And on the other hand, uh, someone like geographer Andreas Malm, the Swedish geographer, um, makes the argument that we need to be in a war economy mode to confront uh, the crises that we face. I mean, this is the example we, we always manage to win for wars. Uh, why can't we do it for war, geopolitical wars? Why can't we do it for this? But war economies are, are economies where liberties are restricted. So in how, how do you see, as architects, how, what positions can we take in this uncomfortable position, position between 
wanting to maintain let's say, enlightenment values of liberty uh, and freedom uh, and the need to act in a coordinated way uh, with central, in some way centralization of power. Great, great question. And if I'd, I'd really enjoy it if you could email it to me because I only got half of it. But if I get, if I get, if I get what you're saying, okay. So the modern project is a project of emancipation, which is true, and that is often how it's justified. What is absolutely clear, particularly in recent history, is that one person's emancipation is another person's slavery. And the, the inequalities of which so-called freedom has, has inflicted on the world is, are, I think, much more profound than the benefits of this sort of utopian urge towards full liberty. And if you take the more extreme examples of so-called liberty, i.e. those of the libertarian right, and what they're doing both in terms of the pandemic, what they're doing in terms of um, politics in in many countries um, won't name what's happening with the governor of Florida. But if you look at if you look at the the sense of of the use of the of that term of of liberty is actually a form of they're actually on the back of it imposing forms of slavery. So one needs to be incredibly careful with with that. Of course, the general sense of architecture being there for the social good, which I think is rather different than, than the project of liberty, should remain, absolutely. But there needs to be a, 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 a amelioration of people's living conditions through their, their spatial conditions. That, you know, that, that, that seems to me a, to be a no-brainer. But I wouldn't tie that to the, to the kind of the more extreme versions of, of of liberty which are being talked about in the world at the moment and at that moment then I would say that the more contested and more confrontational and the more um, radicalized version which Andreas Malm outlines is something which is probably necessary whether one actually takes the streets like my brother um, and confronts the, what he calls the carbon state with his fragile body is one thing, but I think as a point of principle in terms of contesting these dominant forces, yeah, you have, we have to do it. And as public intellectuals, well, I think we have to do it, we have a responsibility to do it, which is why I ended up with that slide. Um, I'm not sure that fully answered your question because I didn't fully hear it. So I'm, I may have answered something completely different, like, do you enjoy swimming? One final question. Go ahead. You can hear me? Just. Yeah, go on. I have a question just about you think that it matters that instead of uh, forcing or encouraging policymakers, governors to think about solutions for upcoming climate problems, you think that does it does matter to encourage to encourage people? Uh, like especially low income people to join to this movement because the low income could someone could someone nearer the microphone repeat the question because I, I I can't I actually can't hear it so if someone nearer the microphone could Yeah. Yeah, my question was that do you think that does it matter to forcing or encouraging uh, governments or policymakers to do uh, to do something for the upcoming climate change? Do you think does it matter to do something to encourage public uh, to encourage people who are non-expertise people, especially low-income people, because I believe that a huge portion of population in the world are low-income people. So that would be like an automatic process and less default process. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in real trouble I'm, um, hearing the question. 
Is it something about what's the role of government and policymakers? Uh, it's about encouraging uh, low income to tell what is the role of low income to tell in finding the solution. No, it's not coming through. What if Charlotte, if you could, could you put the question into the chat and I can try to I respond in the chat or um sorry, the, the, the microphone is going really, really blurry. What is the role of low income people? Um, the role of low income people No. We're we're typing it in. You're typing it in, great. What is the role of low income people to do something to lower the effect of climate change? Ah, uh, well, that's. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I would phrase the question like that because do they have the agency of the non low income people to do anything? And therefore, in asking a question like that, it's like I said about resilience that. You can be resilient in a technocratic regime, and then everyone else has to just get on with it. So I'm, I think that I would slightly rephrase the question by saying we need to understand the position and embodied experiences of the dispossessed, of the low income, of people most affected by climate. We need to put that absolutely central to our thought processes and ways of acting. Now, so the role therefore of the low income people is not an instrumental role, but it's a role of understanding the, the situation which they've been cast. And so that, that, that slide I went over very quickly, which just showed this is where carbon CO2 is being produced. And this is where people are most affected by it is like a kind of an inverse map. And therefore, to ask the people who are most affected to deal with, with climate change seems to me to be unfair in the same way as to ask people of colour to deal with issues of structural racism seems to me to be unfair. Thank you uh, very much, Jeremy, for your fantastic... <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And I'm sorry if, if, if I came across as rather strident. I think this virtual world does that. Because if you've been in the room, I, I, I might have seen some of your eyes and you or some of you going, oh, my God, shut up. But I didn't have that. So I was just going sort of out it comes. But if you want to email, if you want to email me, I'm going to go now. Thanks a lot.